We are back again, live from Ceia to Portugal and Austin. We are moving on to our second keynote session, and to present the next speaker, let us welcome our EMC, Andrea Passos. So, I hope you are enjoying your time with us. I'm looking forward to our next keynote speaker, a professor, a researcher, and an entrepreneur who will be joining us from Austin, Texas. He once said that, essentially, we need robots to do tasks that come under what we call the three Ds, dull, dirty, and dangerous. And I think we all dream of having one of those robots one day in our lives, right? Our keynote speaker is an associate professor of aerospace engineering at the University of Texas at Austin and General Dynamics Endowed Faculty Fellow. He received his PhD and Master degrees in Electrical Engineering from Stanford University. In Austin, he leads the human-centered robotics laboratory focused on the control and experimentation with walking robots and exoskeletons, design of high-performance ground systems and algorithms for active sensing in human environments. Is also a founding member of the UT Robotics Portfolio Program and the UT Robotics Center of Excellence. He was the UT Austin's lead for DARPA's Robotics Challenge with NASA Johnson Space Center, where he helped to design and test the Valkyria humanoid robot. He has been awarded the NASA Elite Team Award for his contributions to NASA's Johnson Space Center Software Robotics and Simulation Division. He is also a founding member and scientific advisor for Aptronic Systems, a company focused on human-centered robotic products and R&D in human augmentation exoskeletons and humanoids. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Luis Sentis. Hello, everyone. Wanted to start thanking uh, John Eckhart and uh, Marco Bravo for providing uh, my name as a keynote speaker for, uh, for this wonderful com conference between uh, uh, UT Austin and Portugal. And, uh, and also mentioning to you that I'm an Iberian fellow for uh, the Portuguese attendance. I was uh, born and raised in, uh, in Barcelona, Spain. So I'm extremely happy to be here. Thank you also to Andrea the discussions, the moderator, and all the uh, event coordination uh, team. Um, so I'm going to actually uh, share my uh, screen if the um, organizing team um, allows me, and I'll have uh, some slides to accompany my uh, presentation. And you can see here in my background in the meantime, this is the picture of my um, robotics lab uh, and part of the robotics consortium that we have at UT. Uh, uh, in several departments, and you can see all these uh, wonderful machines that are helping us to uh, pursue um, academic research and so field research as well. So let me go and uh, start sharing. Okay. Okay. So. So here we are, and um, um, I, I named the, the, the presentation Invention and Commercialization of Human-Centered Robots through Academic Industry Collaborations with NASA. There's a lot of uh, words and, and different institutions um, and flavors in this, in this sentence, but, but really is what it takes to, um, to innovate from, from the creation of the, what we in the US we call 6.1, 6.2 research, which is foundational research. Um, motivated um, a lot of it by um, uh, long-range uh, pursuits by NASA and, and uh, the Department of Defense, uh, all the way to transforming these uh, basic foundational research into technology transfer products, um, IP and copyrights uh, and, and softwares, and ultimately um, commercialization uh, through pilot programs and through development of products. Also, there is a long list of um, um, uh, affiliations I have here below my name. I'm an associate professor at UT. I'm director of the Human Center Robotics Lab, and obviously uh, uh, the, the, it means that uh, the humans are, are, are uh, take uh, precedence over, over robotic systems. I'm the founder of Atronic Systems and a former contractor for NASA, uh, NASA Johnson Space Center. Um, 
So my journey at UT Austin started earlier when I spent a summer in Berkeley, in, uh, in uh, University of Berkeley, Berkeley in 96, and, and really never left back to my birth country, Spain. I was uh, being there in Bay Area, I was inevitably drawn to work in Silicon Valley before joining Stanford for, uh, for my PhD, for my master's PhD, and as a matter of fact, postdoc as well. So regarding research, there are a few laboratories in the US building human-centered robots. They are fairly complex. One of the reasons is that dealing with such systems requires much mechatronic design and complex emb embedded and powered systems. And all of this is before starting the deploying controls and AI systems, which is really, really uh, sort of the end uh, product of the research. On the other hand, we're being exposed to a revolution in robotics. Building a small size quadrupedal robotic systems, for instance, is not much more difficult, difficult than purchasing low-cost hobbyist motors and sticking them together with uh, almost like uh, you know, low-cost uh, mechanics. So we might be at an inflection point in research and academic institutions in which scaling robotic training facilities um, for education and research um, might become an economic uh, reality. And then we're gonna see that across the world um, in, uh, in the US, in Europe, and, and elsewhere, that we're gonna see a scaling of these facilities, much the same way that we've, we've seen the scaling with, um, uh, with uh, experimental physics facilities, for instance. In a hypothetical future, robots could be strong participants in our economies too, that's called robonomics. They could have both the role of agents that originate transactions, the suppliers, the sellers, and the role of agents receiving and even using them, consumers and buyers. This would only make sense, obviously, if a robot economy could use net capital growth that raises the demand for human labor. Human is always uh, preceding um, the need for robotics, and, and therefore labor dynamics has to be contemplated whenever we employ robotic systems. Such a scenario could arise with the use of new technologies designed for wider contribution by individuals or small corporation, corporations, such as a backbone made out of small contra smart contracts and IoT. So they go hand in hand, these uh, technologies, robotics and IoT and, um, and, uh, and the cloud um, infrastructure as well and contracts. So as such, one perspective is that robots are here to make us more productive and increase economic growth. Productivity can be seen as the distance between our desires and accomplishments, how much of our desires we're accomplishing. So in my view, the goal of robotics, in particular humans and the robots, is such that we can greatly increase our productivity with all social considerations, such as continuous improvements in median income, life expectancy, and more. And we see efforts um, across the world of creating uh, measurement units that depict more uh, the wider spectrum of a human uh, uh, comfort and, 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 and human well-being, such as the inclusive development index that we see here that incorporates other aspects like life expectancy, poverty levels, public debt, uh, inequality, and so on and so forth. And, and, and robotics has to feed, and the labor dynamics associated with robotics has to feed contemplating uh, this wider discussion that not only engineers like me, but then you know, public policy, um, um, uh, other institutions as well, um, uh, regulation and so on, they have to at least be consulted. Um, and to support these demands, human-centered robots need to keep up with the embodiment, their bodies, their, their, their mechanics, their, their mechatronics, and computational complexity in order to accomplish complex chores, to move safely, to conform to clutter, to woe us for entertainment, for instance, and, and more. And as complexity grows, we need to make those systems technologically and economically sustainable. And this is one of the things that um, the whole cycle of foundational research, expensive um, uh, kind of um, prototypes being created uh, for investigation to commercialize them to uh, the economies of scale and then going back to academia. And now uh, these companies uh, not only you know, selling products, but then helping back um, um, academic and research institutions and space institutions in order to um, to uh, bring down pricing, uh, uh, have access, bring access uh, of robots uh, to everyone, to all students, to all ages, uh, and make them more economically feasible. That's, that's, that's one of the goals 
uh, to close the cycle, um, high performance to feasibility. So um, human-centered robotics is not about mobility or lean manipulation. It's about um, emulating the human body and applying ergonomic principles. For instance, to prepare outposts to explore space or study human robot teaming to increase productivity, um, we need to contemplate a wider spectrum. It's about human factors and emulations of the human physiology, the cognitive processes and human-like communications. This is what humanoids is about. Um, when I finished my PhD at Stanford, I had worked mostly in simulations of robotic systems. So simulations really uh, apply across, I, across science, as you science, guys probably know. Probably know, probably know. And, but, but simulations are not the reality. And it's important that we, we bring experimental facilities that are of the highest possible caliber. So in the last decade here, with the help of, um, of the University of Texas at Austin and Cochrane School of Engineer, I've spent my research effort building, or even better, helping students to build human-centered robotic systems for space, defense applications, and industrial environments. I hired the company Mecha Robotics, which was ultimately sold to Google a few years ago. I hired them in 2011 to build a slender bipedal robot Robots contain these uh, items called actuators. And in this case, um, the kind we use were called series elastic actuators. You see a spring there, that's an elastic actuator. It's an invention by MIT. They consist on long, they consisted at the time of long linear drives equipped with classical motors and all rotating ball screw with a spring loaded output. Their size was large. Here we can see multiple generations of series elastic actuators uh, produced at MIT um, uh, uh, with Rodney Brooks Group uh, back in the times, then uh, with the Domo, then uh, IHMC is an institute in Florida prominent in robotics, and then some of the walking robots, and finally Hume, a robot that I commissioned uh, here for uh, being uh, uh, developed at the University of Texas. All of them are fairly large, and that precisely spur um, uh, innovation at the University of Texas. My student, Nick Payne, then a PhD student and also an undergrad at the University of Texas, so when the whole um, academic program, uh, did, at the time, you know, back in 2012, 2011, 2012, did not have a background in actuators. He started from zero, that's why I want to call it from zero to humanoids. But after spending a few weeks at Mecha Robotics in San Francisco, he understood not only the great things they were doing because they were doing really great things. And then this kind of stash or internship, it was great for him. But he also understood the mechanical shortcomings from this company, the mistakes they were making. Soon afterwards, Nick came up with this design that you see here in the screen, where the motor up here drives the ball nut down on the left side instead of the ball screw. And the ball screw slides inside and out into a piston-like drive on the right back side. Um, with a chassis that is spring-loaded and is connected to the output joints of the robotic system. This is a, a, a serious elastic actuator that is very atypical because we are rotating the ball screw. So ingenious mechanical design allowed to um, uh, go from these very large actuators to something that fits in your palm, in the, in, in your, in your, in the, in the palm of your hand. So the result was a 50% reduction in length and 30% reduction in width making it much more compact for human-centered designs. And of course, we preserve the power density, the, the, the ability of, of moving uh, uh, quick and, and, um, and lifting heavy or light payloads. So that kind of innovation is what take place um, in, uh, in our facilities and, and uh, we strive to, uh, um, to perpetuate. As my student put it, Nick, the, this invention, UTC, a uh, copyright by the University of Texas, Weights the same weight as a pineapple, about a one kilogram uh, for um, uh, in the international units, if you will, can lift a, a bear uh, uh, um, uh, and can, can, can lift a bear, which is a very heavy, obviously, animal, uh, about uh, 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 300 kilograms, uh, um, a, small, a small bear, I guess, and can sense the forces of a sparrow landing on the bear. And that's one of the properties of these serious elastic actuators. They are designed for human-centered robotic systems. This means that they contain sensors inside that they are sensitive to touch. And that was a revolution back then, and it continues being a revolution that the University of Texas has built expertise on 
or human-robot interaction. Within months, the UTC, uh, this actuator, seemed to be everywhere. At NASA, Johnson Space Center being used for rehabilitation. In Florida, in this prominent Institute of uh, Human Cognition, being used for astronaut exercising exoskeletons. In China, being developed for manufacturing in the Shenzhen area. And in Korea, being used for sport training systems, um, uh, you know, events, uh, equipment for exercising with motors, but they have to be human uh, aware and they have to be safe as well, which are properties of these type of serious elastic actuators. So that was kind of the impact, that, the impact that, 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 that Nick Payne had uh, within months of developing uh, that actuator, and again, and again uh, appreciated uh, by, by the, our facilities, the media, the coverage that we have from uh, the University of Texas and the Cochrane School of Engineering. Here are test vests that Nick built with various configurations to test performance are part, as part of his PhD. You see already a very advanced actuators um, in different forms. Uh, so the variability is very important, trying different mechanical configurations, trying the different materials as well. Um, uh, different uh, um, metallic materials, but also viscoelastic and rubber materials that can, that can supplement these elastic capabilities. And then test beds as well for testing the properties on materials that ultimately will be used on these actuation systems for human robot interaction. So a very comprehensive um, and thorough process. Uh, again, uh, thanks to the quality of the students that are coming to our university and then the whole traineeship, uh, traineeship program that we uh, were able to, to build uh, around them. Uh, so uh, here is the use of the UTC uh, uh, from the Institute of Human Machine and Cognition at the Florida and NASA Johnson Space Center in the X11 MENA exoskeleton to provide power to ankle actuation in order to provide exercising capabilities for astronauts in space but this exoskeleton really has dual use, and it can be used as well on Earth for rehabilitation or for um, endowing the ability of uh, a walk for all these populations that they have lost part of the, their mobility or even their full mobility. So the dual use uh, is very important. When we develop exoskeletons or devices um, for uh, you know space uh, defense, then we want them to have also an impact in other industries here on Earth as well. Uh, here, more use of, uh, of this UTC for um, exercising systems in all possible configurations. So we were truly delighted to see the spread of these systems across, um, across usages, especially with these prominent institutions, uh, most, uh, most notably uh, NASA Johnson Space Center, who has been a champion of, uh, uh, of human-centered robots used for space and for astronaut uh, well-being. In the midst of all of this, came the DARPA Robotics Challenge that was in 2012. It was a response to the Fukushima area tsunami and the subsequent nuclear reactor meltdown. Among the rubble, robots should have been able, had they existed for that purpose, to bring back cooling power and perform other dangerous tasks under high levels of radiation. The reason why the reactors blew up is it was not immediate is because of a power failure. They were, we were not able to uh, provide power, I guess the, 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 the experts down there, they were not able to provide power uh, because they couldn't have a person entering the facility and bringing a set of batteries to continue powering the cooling system of the reactors. So the fact that nobody could be present there, it was the reason that it caused this catastrophic uh, disaster that cost billions of dollars to, to Japan. And that motivated, obviously, the intent to employ um, avatars, autonomous robotic systems that could go in these facilities, walk among the rubble, and then deploy um, industrial uh, equipment, connect it, plug it, connect it to the facilities, and continue running it um, until they could, um, they could uh, have a longer term um, um, solution. So following this announcement uh, of the DARPA Robotics Challenge, which really, it was a competition that was seeking multiple entries around the world, to participate, bringing especially robots that have mobility and manipulation with a preference for legged mobility, not necessarily bipedal, but bipedal was obviously attractive uh, to check the, the, the state of the art and how well we're able to control these systems and all sorts of systems that they had to navigate 
around um, uh, multiple setups that were uh, reminiscent of those in industrial setups. So we had uh, walking in in, uh, in cinder blocks that the wheel robots cannot really do it. And so it had to be legged. Uh, we had uh, turning valves. We had opening heavy doors, industrial doors that are really heavy for um, for simple robots and lightweight robots to open. Um, uh, we was, there was connecting a hose to uh, uh, to, an, to an outlet, a, a hose like a, a water hose. It's a very complicated task. We had the, we had drilling and manipulating a number of tools, and therefore a dual arm manipulation. For instance, inserting the hose or turning the valve, it required two arms. Uh, all of these led to this kind of design. So there were many many entries. One of them, uh, following this announcement, uh, my lab, my lab uh, was hired by NASA Johnson Space Center to help build the Valkyrie humanoid robot. So here you see a depiction, a concept, our prior to construction of the system. The end system ended up to be actually pretty similar. Um, and the, the human form is, is attractive for, for, uh, for multiple purposes. Uh, it's attractive for ergonomics. If we're going to be using these robots for um, emulations of uh, astronauts in the space um, in, a, in, a, um, in a planetary outpost, for instance, uh, the, the size and feet and, and footprint of a human can be important for testing the size of the facilities, um, uh, living in these confined small spaces, how comfortable it is. So ergonomics is a strong motivator for having the humanoid form. There's also social um, reasons as well that uh, long-term uh, isolation, um, uh, you know, having a social aspect and a, and a kind of a human anthropomorphic aspect can be beneficial as well. And as an educational component as well, is an attract attraction point for students when they see these, these forms, they, uh, it really opens their imagination and it, it is a, it's an attractor of talent. So those were some of the reasons uh, to bring these robots uh, to the table. And uh, we were also, very lucky to uh, win the uh, Texas, uh, a large Texas ETF grant for $1.5 million. That was also with Texas A&M. So Texas really was devoted uh, to um, make this uh, successful. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the teaming between Johnson Space Center, the University of Texas at Austin, and Texas A&M as a, as a holistic effort. So we, uh, we then began a 15 months journey to build these, uh, these systems uh, uh, by populating Building 32, uh, for those of you who have been at NASA, Building 32 at Johnson Space Center is one of the uh, uh, important buildings. Uh, the Apollo Lunar Lander had been uh, thoroughly tested, I think for thermal testing uh, down there back in the 1960s. Uh, it's a room that doesn't have windows, it's completely green, so you, you end up believing that you can only see green. Pretty much, uh, we spent there thousands of hours. Myself and um, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and students, and uh, there was a team of fifty researchers overall, and multiple of them from University of Texas, uh, without much sleep or any break for these fifteen months. It was one of the most stressful uh, situations we've endured to I, I've been personally endured to date. Uh, but but it was absolutely worthwhile. And here came out this this beauty, uh, the Valkyrie humanoid. Is actually our actuator yeah. built with serious elastic actuators over its entire body. Some of them inspired by my lab's research. And after 15 months, it was first deployed for disaster response uh, field testing. Uh, so um, students themselves, they uh, team up with uh, uh, professional uh, scientists and engineers at NASA, and then uh, directed academically uh, from, uh, with, uh, from me, and then uh, with NASA mentors as well, uh, forming a team of 50 people, uh, field-oriented deploy deploying for deploying the systems, and that accelerated their, um, their learning uh, tremendously. Um, and each student themselves, they are now positioned in, in, a, in, a, in places uh, of high responsibility, thanks to, uh, to this program. So, uh, the loop uh, uh, of NASA inspiring these projects and the University of Texas um, uh, bringing their uh, inventions and their uh, ingenuity and their, their talent of students is a great uh, uh, synergistic effort that, uh, that has happened and will continue to happen uh, to reach uh, uh, these success levels. NASA has made this program one of uh, the most successful uh, programs in the world. 
with uh, humanoid units, uh, we see the predecessor Robonaut on the left and then uh, Valkyries, uh, Valkyries over here, here deployed deploy in various in universities, universities across the world across the for world field world. robotics uh, testing. Um, uh, so NASA uh, acts as an integrator. They repair the systems, they send them back to universities. I think there is MIT, Edinburgh, um, um, uh, there was one in um, uh, Northeastern as well. Um, and, uh, um, and, and then one stays, uh, one of them at the HMC that uh, moves to the HMC and Johnson Space Center. And then in our case, University of Texas, it has students permanently or going back and forth, as a matter of fact, to the facility, to NASA Johnson Space Center and developing uh, algorithms, um, uh, studies on control systems and dynamical systems and then AI as AI well, as well. Uh, in a rural uh, basis. Rural. And then the and wonderful the thing is that we're publishing this research in some of the top journals in the world. So NASA doesn't stop us, on the contrary, they uh, incentivize us to, to publish um, uh, this research as much as possible. So here are three of my PhD students, uh, uh, Gray, Rachel, uh, and, and Stephen, funded by NASA. They have a program called NSTRGO, is, a, is one of the most generous fellowships. These three students got it from my lab. Operating the Valkyrie a couple of years ago, Stephen on the right, high, uh, right side, um, is now uh, a full-time employee at NASA and one of the key members of the controls and, and, uh, um, and the field um, uh, robotics team, pushing the boundaries uh, of uh, human, ro human robots for the space applications. So that also serves as a training program where students ultimately become leaders at NASA themselves, uh, students from the University of Texas at Austin. In the future, um, uh, NASA, um, colleagues and I agree on new paradigms for building, maintaining, maintaining and operating deep space facilities. For instance, a key idea is to create tightly networked teams of habitat modules that themselves are smart um, and connected and heter heterogeneous habitat robots that they can perform a variety of tasks and even reassign tasks uh, at runtime. We call this idea Habibots. So the, the, the back end, the front end, the back end, and the engineering um, are fundamental blocks for building these uh, kind of um, long range habitat facilities in space that can do things like self build themselves or self, self assemble, self set up and configure, monitor operations, diagnose failures, and perform repairs appropriate in remote setups and also perform the science, right? Um, like uh, telemetry points or underwater uh, systems for uh, those plants that have uh, uh, bodies of, uh, of water, of, um, of liquid. Um, so uh, the, the, that's again, we are mentioning here the, the, uh, in here the larger spectrum of, of robotics and their, their connectivity and the task allocation, which are forms in a way of, if you will, of a small robot economy where um, they're negotiating uh, which robot is capable of performing a task and, and, um, and there's a contract performed um, as well for, for this to happen in order to happen it uh, happen, happen safely. So a lot of the things that we see that are important on Earth um, are equally important um, in a space. Another effort going on at UT Austin in this wonderful facility I'm showing here is called the Anahis building. It was just open a few weeks ago. Is the devel development of a humanoid facility to train students on field deployment for logistics and maintenance in a space and other remote environments such as Navy uh, vessels. So these human robots are actually um, a reality. The one on the right side is coming in, a, in just a few weeks. It's a robot uh, produced by a, a company. And then uh, other human robots are going to join as well for these uh, um, uh, you know, heavy sort of uh, experimental uh, facility for training students in, a, in field robotic applications for space and, um, um, and, uh, and defense applications, if you will. Um, all right, so after the DARPA Robotics Challenge, uh, these students I've, I've been talking about, Nick Payne and I founded a company, Aptronic, in early 2016. Again, uh, greatly helped by the Cochrane School of Engineering, University of Texas. One of the goals was to develop advanced prototypes to furnish laboratories with robotics equipment. And you see here, this is actually their website. So it's, a, it's right now a mature company with about 30 employees and, and, and a substantial uh, revenue. Uh, again, thanks to uh, the efforts by uh, everyone here. 
Um, so here you have Nick Payne on the left side, co-founder with me of Atronic Systems and a few events and future systems with prototype. Here we see the Draco humanoid and um, uh, the Sajid and uh, Apex exoskeleton, both high performance uh, that the company is providing them as equipment. You see also in the upper side, simpler equipment that is provided for educational purposes to uh, universities across the nation and to historical black uh, institutions as well. Uh, the company came to be thanks to the Cockrell School of Engineering Innovation Center, who gave us commercialization, a commercialization award back in 2015, I guess it was, uh, to spin off the technology and commercialization efforts. So here you see Louise Epstein and Bob McAuliffe, um, who were the directors of the Cockrell School of Engineering Innovation Center, an effort that continues happening here at UT Austin in order to spur um, innovation and take uh, these uh, inventions from foundational basic research out to the field, out to prototypes, and out to wider um, uh, scalable uh, products that can benefit from economies of, uh, of a scale. So thank you to uh, all of these participants uh, for um, helping us to create this company. The company started producing industrial series elastic actuators, and it continues doing so, and it sells them as a product. But the ambition, the ambition since then has been moved to logistic systems, space robotics, and defense systems. Uh, uh, and and the, 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 the scaling and the, 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 the model of, of business, the business model, are slightly different for larger systems than are for uh, for these kind of low-cost uh, mass-produced uh, systems um, uh, what is, in, is interesting in, in itself, if you will. So here are all the components that um, in 2017, 2018, um, the company built, uh, such as the medulla root node and the axon network amplifiers. These are building blocks that you interconnect and you can build basically any robotic systems that you want. These are the embedded systems that provide all of the high power um, uh, systems for um, powering your you know, these energetic uh, uh, propulsion systems and all of the um, communication um, backend uh, uh, through serial communications in order to scale and build any robotic systems that you want, but also a front end with standard um, real-time computers, PCs, basically on the left side, that can be used for controlling and developing AIs and, and other sophisticated systems for this uh, kind of robotic um, equipment. As a collaboration with Aptronic, Houston Tillotson, which is a, uh, a black, uh, historic, uh, historical black university, and UT Austin, we developed liquid cool viscoelastic actuators. They are inside this robotic system, allowing more compact designs and advanced research test beds. These inventions are part of IP at the University of Texas in Austin, licensed to the company, which is done through the Office of Technology Commercialization, another of the institutions within uh, at the University of Texas that is doing fantastic at spurring innovation. One of the most advanced prototypes has been the Sajid exoskeleton that we developed between UT and the University and the Anatronic. It consists of 12 degrees of freedom, eight of them actuated with serious elastic actuation and liquid cooling using linear series elastic actuators. It allows to amplify forces of operators for heavy duty logistics, for instance. So these are geared towards uh, healthy individuals to reduce injury with car carrying heavy duty equipment. Think about logistics, think about last mile delivery, think about any, any task that requires carrying uh, heavy backpacks, but also um, they could eventually be employed for rehabilitation as well uh, for health applications. So a couple of products and prototypes that have been designed by uh, Aptronic. And this is the latest product of the company, a collaborative arm that can lift its own weight and is extremely compliant for human robot interaction. You see here uh, Nick Payne, that's actually the student and founder of the company himself, operating this in a collaborative fashion. And that reduces, there's a heavy box, reduces completely uh, the need for him to apply strong forces, and therefore, if he would be a worker, he would reduce injury <clears throat> over time. <clears throat> this arm has only 
not only has a passive mode like this one of support, but it can also be autonomous. So it has motors inside and it can move uh, by its own wheel uh, using AI and computer vision. So this is the kind of um, great things that uh, can happen in, uh, in, uh, uh, with this innovation. Overall, it has been exciting to give pitches, applying for government contracts, selling products and raising funds uh, for the company and partner with UT as well. The company has now 30 employees and several mid-sized defense and industrial contracts, and it sells products as well. So I'm gonna stop here in, uh, uh, I still have a few more slides, but uh, for um, uh, we saw uh, space robotics, we saw um, uh, uh, innovation and creating a company. Um, I wanted to talk about things that motivate me and um, in the realm of, um, of um, productivity uh, uh, within the areas of space and aerospace robotics. Um, and so some of the things that motivate me personally at the, at the scientific level, um, at the innovation level, uh, are things like exploring the universe with team of humans and the robotic systems that are closely coupled with uh, astronaut interactions and, and uh, astronaut operations. Um, mitigate the effects of decreasing population in developed countries with robot technology, with avatars, for instance, uh, that can be helping us at home in transportation and smart cities and, and whatnot. Make workers and people at home more productive using human-centered robots. And, and doing that without uh, um, altering the labor dynamics that we have uh, today, the, the human capital is the number one priority in all these conversations. So we don't, we don't want to employ robots without considering the human, we want them to team together, not replace them. And secure the world in fair and humanitarian ways. And uh, you know the role of, um, of uh, the United States has been um, key in a, in a lot of the uh, peaceful and pacifying efforts around the world. So the Department of Defense continue being very important for, uh, for all of us. My lab's research swings between theory and experimentation. And at the intersection of both, we have an exciting new project focused on intelligent human robots together with two companies, uh, Thinking Robots and, uh, and Aptronic. It's a, it's a relatively large contract um, funded by the Office of Naval Research, another prominent organization funding uh, AI and, uh, and robotics in, in the United States. Um, the goal is to combine symbolic and non-symbolic approaches, uh, basically AI and, and mobility and manipulation, thus enabling human or robots to team perfectly with humans, um, again, fulfilling this human-centeredness of, uh, of the research. Because humans use semantic instructions or demonstrations uh, to uh, pass on experience, but robots move using geometric representation and controls. We focus on these topics. We focus on things like whole body controllers that translates semantic commands and, and symbolic uh, representations into, into uh, motor commands, if you will. We leverage uh, technologies and techniques for learning from, from online um, uh, demonstrations, visual and kinesthetic demonstrations, and as well from instructions using cognitive architectures that they can understand natural languages and do interpretation of vague commands. Um, and also they can retrieve information and then just have an interaction with, with you as if you were another colleague or another worker. So that the goal is to endow these capabilities to robotic systems so they can truly, truly teammates. And we're also endowing uh, what we call mental models to robots for, for them to understand what is your physiological and then what is the, uh, your, your, um, your, your, some of your uh, mental states, some of your you know, stress levels and uh, attention and, uh, and fatigue and, and other things that are important for running an operation as a true uh, teammate operation. Uh, there is also part of it which is longitudinal studies. This means that robots are used across um, multiple days uh, instead of uh, being used just for a, for a single demo. So as a root capability uh, for this project, we focus on bipedal locomotion, for instance, to get us from point A to point B. Whoa. Here you see uh, the CMU's AI, uh, Army Futures Command AI from, Hub, is Colonel Mati, and there is people from Carnegie Mellon University. They're trying to bring this robot down in our laboratory. It's one of the only three robots in the world that can uh, sustain that beating and still uh, remain up. And again, speaking uh, towards the capabilities that the students, which really start from, from scratch, uh, just uh, at the beginning of their PhDs, they can accomplish being world leaders just after a few, a few years. My student, Dong Kim, uh, Kim, led this research for several years. 
So it was a high risk research. And to me really embodies the perfect example of a PhD in robotics, experimentation, theory, building robots, going back to experimentation, and so on and so forth, and persisting through, through the difficulties of being one of the only laboratories in the world that can accomplish these capabilities. Um, fortunately, this effort paid off, and he's now faculty at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, which is one of the top ones in the US. Again, uh, some of the things that we uh, accomplish uh, here at UT. Um, our project is not only about locomotion, but about manipulation as well. So we focus um, on inference of articulated bodies. In here, when uh, this is actually a project with the University of Barcelona in Spain, um, that they have a very strong team on manipulation of soft objects. And, um, and uh, so we have students from Barcelona coming to UT as well. We'd we'll love to have from love Porto have from or, from Porto or, from or from Lisbon or any of your universities as well. Um, this is a very talented student that as he opens the door, he doesn't know the door, what it is. If it's a revolute door, a prismatic door, he doesn't know the size of the door. So he learns, he does an inference pro uh, uh, process to learn these things uh, at runtime and he publishes obviously this research as well. But effective teaming is likely to require more knowledge about the human. I am interested in awareness of robots on people's productivity. And productivity is modeled routinely. So the work here explores mental models in the, first, in the form of first order dynamical systems to model, to model our desire to do something, for instance, going exercising. This is used by behavioral scientists. Here, self-efficacy is basically um, 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 uh, confidence and Q2 action is motivation affected by barriers, uh, perceived barrier obstacles, uh, internal skills of communication. So you could think about a cell phone app that measures your, your attention, your fatigue, your, um, your motivation, um, uh, your, the evolution of these states, and then it tries to influence those um, in order to make a whole operation, teaming operation, more productive. The, actually, the um, Army Research Laboratory that um, is paying for a lot of the research that we do here at the University of Texas has very strong programs on, on, a, on a inf inference of human um, states in order uh, to, um, to um, accelerate human AI teaming capabilities, if you will. Um, there is great work in human odds. Uh, in the EU, there is a consortium called Comanoid, um, accomplishing amazing capabilities such as mounting fixtures on, Air on Airbus airplanes. One of the problems for further deployment is the lack of commercial mobile robots, so why, that's why companies are very important. But more companies here and in, in Europe and, and in Asia are popping up, addressing this difficulty of building these complex hardwares, making it more economic, and, um, and available to, to everyone. <clears throat> I mentioned my student, one of my students funded by NASA earlier, but Stephen went on to lead this demo as part of his PhD research. This is a pure integrative project combining odometry, localization, motion planning, and human role interaction. The sponsor was the Combat Terrorism Technical Support Office. It consists of navigating among rubble, retrieving a bag from a car, and safely depositing it into a bomb containing the vessel. The robot operates as an avatar using supervised teleoperation. So you can see here, this was led by a student at UT Austin, not, I mean, of course, with great help from, from the from, from whole NASA crew, but the lead of this project was a student um, just last year. And he was able to accomplish this um, incredible demo uh, uh, of uh, field deployment, run it about 50 times, and then collecting statistics on the success and, um, and what areas of improvement and what kind of completion rates there is uh, for, uh, for, this, uh, for this kind of demo. You can see a lot of the complex manipulation, overhand, underhand pushes to manipulate the slider, for instance, uh, the container, pushing objects and buttons, um, and everything. Uh, yeah, this is not fully autonomous. This is uh, what we call supervised teleoperation, but there is minimal input. The, the amount of cognitive and physical load that is needed for accomplishing this task is, is fairly minimal, demonstrating breakthroughs on, um, on human role collaborations. So academia is in a good position to evaluate the effect of robotics in our societies. For instance, we conjecture that humans teaming with human-centered robots are more effective than humans alone in tasks such as logistics or maintenance. For instance, they can be put to use to scale up complex infrastructure. Here, P stands for productivity, human-centered productivity. This means not only time of completion or reduced physical and cognitive workload, 
But also, also, also without reducing the human capital, we want to maintain the human capital at the forefront. So we need to design the right experiments, taxonomies, interfaces, and metrics for solid evaluation, including labor dynamics, if you will. Here's a depiction of human robot teaming. Uh, we use models of human backlog as an indicator of stress. Uh, Rachel is, uh, um, um, is uh, emulating a, a clerk, and the robot is helping her in clerical tasks. The robot is trying to know her cognitive states, states of stress at all times, and then it provides more or less um, um, files depending on, um, on, the, on her level of, of work, backlog, and stress. And that is, um, um, speaks towards uh, increasing the productivity of this operation without overwhelming the clerk, uh, the student in this case. So it's a perfect example of human uh, robot teaming, if you will. So towards the end, I want to talk briefly about the UT Robotics uh, Consortium here at the University of Texas. UT Austin just opened a new building called the Anahis Robotics Building. It's actually called Anahis Gym, Gymnasium. It's a completely remodeled uh, building, beautiful uh, Hispanic architecture. And now it's hosting 17 faculty in robotics across engineering and computer science areas, and probably other departments are going to join soon as well. One of the main goals is to train and produce collaborative research for the next generation of students, engineers, and leaders in robotics and embodied uh, AI systems. Here are more depictions of the ribbon cutting ceremony that only took place last Friday. And you can see the many robotic systems, these wonderful facilities that have been um, uh, newly renovated and a hub for innovation in robotics at UT. US Army Futures Command has invested heavily on our technology. Here a quadrupedal a robot is searching for a missing person using collaborative research in areas such as localization, navigation, and motion planning, driven by um, optimal control and information gain um, uh, search problem. So the robot is, is uh, relentlessly searching for um, a person of interest, is using these postures and these lasers and everything to gain information, building those maps, and ultimately, after colliding with the wall, is <laughs> able to find this missing person. And that's important for um, safety, is important for uh, finding survivors in, in, a, in, a, in disaster scenarios, is important for uh, uh, going into places affected by wildfire, uh, wild, uh, wildfires, like we saw in California or Australia, where humans cannot go and find a, finding survivors. He has incredible um, applications across fields. And finally here, um, uh, we delivered this just two weeks ago, uh, lemonade um, across campus using a small service robots. This is an undergraduate student. Uh, she's just turning on an app. And then uh, it's called small and medium delivery systems. Then uh, asking for lemonade. And then the robot goes on and goes to the, uh, the pickup place and is able to deliver items across uh, campus. It's very important, obviously, in, um, in the wake of uh, COVID-19 and the need for uh, separation. And the fact that many students cannot really go across buildings and therefore robotics can increase the productivity across our facilities.